Hello students, welcome to this YouTube channel. Today I will discuss on the famous address made by Abraham Lincoln, Gettysburg Address. Abraham Lincoln was an American statesman, as we know. He was also a politician, a lawyer, who served as the 16th President of the United States from 1861 until his assassination in April 1865. Lincoln laid the nation through the American Civil War, its bloodiest war and its greatest moral, constitutional and political crisis. He preserved the Union, abolished slavery, strengthened the federal government and modernized the US economy. As the leader of the moderate faction of the Republican Party, Lincoln confronted radical Republicans who demanded harsher treatment of the South. War Democrats who rallied a large faction of former opponents into his camp, anti-war Democrats called Copperheads who despised him and irreconcilable secessionists or secessionists who plotted his assassination. Lincoln fought the factions by pitting them against each other, by carefully distributing political patronage and by appealing to the American people. His Gettysburg address, as we can find here, it is the primary focus of this particular lecture, became an iconic call for nationalism. It also inaugurates republicanism, equal rights, liberty and democracy. He suspended habeas corpus and he aborted British intervention by diffusing the Trent Affair. Lincoln closely supervised the war effort, including the selection of generals and the naval blockade that shut down the South's trade. As the war progressed, he maneuvered to end slavery, issuing the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, ordering the army to protect escaped slaves, encouraging border states to outlaw slavery, and pushing through Congress the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which outlawed slavery across the country. Lincoln managed his own re-election campaign. He sought to reconcile his damaged nation by avoiding retribution against secessionists. A few days after the Battle of Appomattox Courthouse, he was shot by John Wykes Booth, an actor and confederate sympathizer, on April 14, 1865. But ultimately, Abraham Lincoln is still remembered as the United States' smarter hero. Now, before going to the text of Gettysburg Address, we must need to know something about the historical context. As you can know that the, the differences between the states in the North and South had always been an apparent and divisive feature of the United States and partly accounted for why the first attempt at cooperative government failed. They were so culturally, demographically and economically different that the country almost never got off the ground in the first place. In the early 1800s, the Northeast emerged as an industrial powerhouse as factories began to pop up across the countryside. Meanwhile, the South remained tied to the land and lucrative cash crops that could grow in the fertile soil. This meant they were way more reliant on slave labor to perform the backbreaking work. The invention of the cotton gene in 1794 only made each slave more productive and served to highlight the importance of slavery to the southern economy. When the settlers continued to push into the western United States, more states applied to join the, the fledgling nation. This posed a problem for the federal government. 
Some new states wanted to allow slavery, while others were committed to stopping its spread. In the middle was the government, which wanted to keep everyone happy and not at war with each other. As both moral outrage at slavery and the South's reliance on forced labor on plantations grew, most administrations attempted to maintain a balancing act between the two sides. Due to the Missouri Compromise, the de facto boundary between slave states and the free states became a very real divide. Throughout the antebellum period, laws were passed to uphold the rights of stakeholders or slaveholders, just as abolitionist sentiments were growing in many parts of the country. And this conflict was tearing the country apart. Decisions like Dred Scott versus Stranford bolstered arguments from states' as rights supporters, and they could do what they wanted in their own territory. This sank Congress's futile attempts to maintain the status quo and keep a balance between slave states and free states. This particular North-South split also was evident during the 1860 election that swept Lincoln into office. Seeing the writing on the wall that Lincoln's arrival likely meant the end of slavery, South Carolina became the first state to secede in December 1860. After a standoff with federal forces, South Carolina artillery opened fire and the civil war officially began. Now the question is why the term Gettysburg Address is being associated with this particular form. After a three-day battle against the Union Army at Gettysburg, Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army retreated on July the 4th, 1863. The battle was not only a major turning point in favor of the Union Army, but was also the largest and the most devastating of the war, with total casualties numbering over 15,000. Four and a half months later, the process of reburying the thousands of bodies that had been shallowly interred on the battlefield had begun, but was not yet complete. In this sobering setting, Lincoln delivered a brief address to an audience of about 15,000 people who interrupted him five times to applaud. Newspapers across the North was also responded very favorably. Lincoln's comments that day, however, comprised only a brief moment in the cemetery's dedication. Prior to Lincoln's three-minute speech came music, a prayer, and a featured oration. A two-hour discourse delivered by Edward Everett, Richard, Massachusetts politician and the former president of Harvard. While Everett's speech dwelled on the details of the battle, Lincoln attempted to give meaning to the events at Gettysburg, indeed to the Civil War itself, by speaking about the ideals for which he believed the Union stood. Hence, it's a short speech given by Mr. Lincoln, on the occasion of winning the Great Civil War at Gettysburg, soon after which he was assassinated and the rejoicing moment changed to a moment of grief. Now, what is the central motive behind this speech? On June 1, 1865, Senator Charles Sumner referred to the most famous speech ever given by President Abraham Lincoln. In his eulogy on the slain president, he called the Gettysburg Address as a monumental act. He said Lincoln was mistaken that the world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Rather, the Bostonian remarked, the world noted at once what he said and will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech itself. There are five known copies of the speech in Lincoln's handwriting, each with a slightly different text and named for the people who first received it. There we can get Nicolay, Hay, Avery, Brancroft, and Place. Two copies apparently were written before delivering the speech, one of which probably was the reading copy. The remaining ones were produced months later for soldiers' benefit events. Despite widely circulated stories to the contrary, 
The president did not dash off a copy aboard to train to Gettysburg. Lincoln carefully prepared his major speeches in advance. His steady, even script in every manuscript is consistent with a firm writing surface, not the notoriously bumpy Civil War era trains. Additional versions of the speech appeared in newspapers of the era, feeding modern day confusion about the authoritative text. Ever since Lincoln wrote it in 1864, this version has been the most often reproduced notably on the walls of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. It is named after Colonel Alexander Bliss, so this is considered as the Bliss copy. As I mentioned that so far as the historical context of this particular address is concerned, an understanding of the backdrop and the events leading to the speech are necessary for a full appreciation and comprehension of Lincoln's speech's power and beauty and timelessness. His speech delivered at any other time may not have had the same influence or remembrance without that very relationship to historical events. But after three years of war weariness on both sides of the conflict, a fierce and a bloody turning point had been reached upon the battlefield of Gettysburg from July 1st to 3rd, 1863. The Civil War had been raging for two bloody and inconclusive years by the summer of 1863. In June 1863, the Union armies won two major victories against the Confederate armies in Vicksburg and Mississippi and Gettysburg and Pennsylvania. These victories came to a heavy cost. The Battle of Gettysburg resulted in the death, wounding or capture of 23,000 soldiers on each side. The town of Gettysburg, with a population of around 2,400, was forced to make plans for burying 3,500 soldiers from that conflict. The new 17-acre cemetery was to be consecrated in November of 1863. And although President Lincoln was invited, he was not the keynote speaker, as I mentioned just now. Regarding the comparison of the two speeches, Edward Ivres that I have already mentioned, where he said, I should be glad if I could flatter myself that I came as near to the central idea of occasion in two hours as Abraham Lincoln did in two minutes. Lincoln's speech, which recalls Pericles' funeral oration, one of the greatest speeches in Western history, traced the history of the nation from the founding to its present. Lincoln located the founding of the nation, not in the ratification of the Constitution, but in the Declaration of Independence. He argued that the Civil War was not only a test of the United States, but would ultimately answer the question as to whether any nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal could ultimately endure. Lincoln calls for the nation to rededicate itself, quote unquote, to a new birth of freedom, to ensure that those interred in the new cemetery would not have died in vain, but that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. This powerful argument placing America at the center of the pursuit of free and democratic government continues to inspire dedication and sacrifice from all Americans, soldiers and citizens alike. So what did this particular text contain? We will look at the text in our next lecture. Stay attached. Thank you.